A few weeks ago, I, I began an article for Bloomberg Opinion, the pandemic is over, the pandemic is not over. Uh, because I think at that juncture, prior to Omicron, many people uh, were talking as if it was over, and that clearly was premature. I'm also reminded of something my friend uh, Nicholas Christakis said earlier this year when I was asking him if it was the uh, beginning of the end. He replied, well, it may just be the end of the beginning. We had high hopes uh, of, of vaccines, and with good reason, because the efficacy of the first vaccines that uh, that were available, Pfizer and then Moderna, in their phase three trials was very high indeed, much higher than I'd expected when I was finishing my book Doom just over a year ago. And so there were grounds for celebration. I think we mostly underestimated the extent to which the virus could mutate in ways that were vaccine evading. I certainly did. I, I've had been collecting vaccines. I've been jabbed three times. Uh, I had a booster shot uh, several weeks ago. And yet I still seem to have picked up uh, the Omicron variant. Uh, Pfizer says 70% uh, uh, is, is the number, but, but I must be in the 30%. And that, that's going to be a lot of people because it's extraordinarily contagious, this new variant. So I look back at, at the beginning of, uh, of 2021, and I think uh, there was a good deal of, of optimism that, that we had uh, solved this and that the end was in sight. And indeed, I kept getting invited to post-pandemic conferences. And I would tell people, you can't talk about that yet. We're not there. The transition from a pandemic to the endemic phase of a disease like this, the phase in which we all kind of get accustomed to it as we've got accustomed to influenza, uh, or for that matter, the common cold, it's a very slow and often imperceptible thing. And it can take a lot longer than you want. And we all want this to be over. We wanted it to be over a year ago. Uh, and unfortunately, although we are very, very done with the virus, it is clearly not done with us, including, including me. So looking back, I, th I think the right state of mind uh, at the end of 2020 was to recognize that we'd achieved something remarkable, or the scientists had achieved something remarkable with the vaccines. But that didn't mean that it was necessarily over or even the beginning of the end. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, there's some truth in that. But I think if, if one asked the question, which René de Resta asked, pre-pandemic, why is anti-vax such a powerful movement? Interestingly, a movement that used to be associated with the left. Why is it so powerful? And one of the answers she came up with was that it really has known how to exploit the possibilities of the internet and of, of social media so that uh, Facebook groups, for example, have played a huge part in promoting very uh, uh, crazy ideas because clearly the virus is much, much more dangerous than the vaccine, probably two orders of magnitude more dangerous. And yet people have held that. And I think some significant number of people, certainly more than 100,000 people have died uh, because they refused to get vaccinated, even when vaccines were widely available. And we'll look back and say, was that the biggest harm that arose from giving so much power uh, to the company that used to be called Facebook? Because Facebook certainly played a key role in this. I think last year, I mean, if, if I look back on what I was uh, writing and saying a year ago, I think I expected us to move more rapidly forward than we have uh, on both on politics and on, on public health. And this sense that we have yet another wave, the full uh, damage of which we can't really quite know yet. I mean, it's hard not to be a bit dispirited by that, even if you haven't got uh, Omicron, as I clearly have. Uh, I, I guess a year ago, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been so gloomy, and I'm the gloomy good fellow, as to expect yet another wave to be coinciding with the, the holidays as clearly as going to happen. We haven't helped ourselves by politicizing a whole range of, of public health issues that back in the 1950s weren't seen as, as political issues. I think it's one of the reasons the United States has done poorly this year, remember, a year ago, we were told that by getting rid of Donald Trump and getting a new president, a great many things would be solved. Well, it's very obvious that that problem, the problem of the pandemic, has not been solved. And the virtue signaling has actually not worked because more people have died of COVID in the US this year than last year. Uh, so, I, you know, my sense is that the public and, and the, our political leaders and the health bureaucracy together have done a very poor job of this. How lasting the damage is going to be, I don't know. But those people who thought they were going to get normalcy in 2021, and a lot of people thought they were, must be feeling pretty disappointed. I never thought that we, we would get normalcy because it was clear that there were going to be all kinds of 
almost cascade-like consequences from the, the pandemic. But, but a lot of people thought they were going to suddenly get back to normal, and that has not happened. It's clear that analogies with influenza can only get us so far because a coronavirus is, is different. Some people think that we should actually look at 1890, uh, a pandemic that was really quite large in terms of its impact. And that was called either the Russian or Asiatic flu. Mm -hmm. uh, but modern researchers think it may well have been a, a coronavirus because one strange feature which made it very different from influenza pandemics was that it didn't affect young people, didn't affect kids very much. And up until now, and I'm touching wood because there is some evidence that Omicron affects children more, evidence from South Africa. But up until now, that's been the thing that's distinguished COVID-19 from the big influenza pandemics of the past. Our kids have not been that vulnerable. And I do believe that one of the reasons people were able to downplay COVID and, and be in many ways frivolous about the need for vaccination was because kids weren't getting sick. Kids were not dying. I believe that when children are getting sick and dying, as is normally the case with respiratory disease uh, uh, pandemics, then, then people are a great deal readier to take action. Uh, COVID has, in, in a way, been downplayed, even through waves of really quite major excess mortality, because the excess mortality was heavily concentrated in the elderly and in the sick at first, and then in the unvaccinated more recently. Uh, and, and I think that explains part of the resistance. I'm not sure the resistance of vaccination would have been so strong if there had been more children getting sick. Mm -hmm. John? The early part of the year, when Larry Summers published a, a, a bombshell of a piece in the Washington Post forecasting that the economy would overheat and inflation would become a serious problem, I at least had the good sense to agree with him. And uh, one of the conversations he and I had around that time was about the analogy with the late 1960s, famously a time when the Federal Reserve slipped up and let inflation expectations jump uh, as they did in the late 60s. People often forget that the the inflation problem that we associate with the 70s uh, predated the oil shock uh, by five years. It really kicked off in, in, uh, in 1968. And I think that was a reasonable analogy because what we were seeing in both cases was pretty huge fiscal splurge in the time of Lyndon Johnson. It was Vietnam plus Great Society. And then the Fed letting inflation expectations out uh, and, and letting them slip. And I think that's kind of what's happened. I think we're all still kind of amazed by an inflation rate of 6.8%, but we shouldn't be. Uh, in, in a way, Jay Powell has done us all a service by proving that Milton Friedman was right, uh, that if you have this kind of a monetary policy, there will be inflation. Now, remember, a lot of people uh, really hated on Larry Summers for that piece, including uh, economists working for the administration. They implied that it was just sour grapes because he didn't have a fancy job in the administration. And, uh, and they insisted that, no, no, this was actually still a very deflationary environment. Uh, secular stagnation would prevail. Uh, and, and they were completely, really horribly wrong. And now, if one looks ahead to next year, Jay Powell has an enormous challenge on his hands. Real rates are strongly negative, as negative as they have been in decades. Uh, in order to get back to positive rates, you have to imagine an enormous tightening of monetary policy. Uh, rate hikes are uh, far greater than the market uh, currently envisions. I mean, the market's thinking of three, maybe four hikes, uh, but all of 25 basis points. That isn't going to get you to positive real rates at the moment anyway. Uh, and I think the challenge for Powell, having uh, got his uh, contract renewed, assuming that that is confirmed, which I think it will be, is how does he cool things down without actually crashing the economy all the way into recession? And, and if he doesn't cool it down, is he going to have uh, uh, on his historical legacy, the man who did the opposite of Paul Volcker, you mentioned Volcker, who brought inflation under control uh, beginning in the late 70s into the early 80s, a very painful process, but he succeeded are people going to say the exact opposite of Jay Powell, that he is the, the Fed chair who let inflation uh, out and, and, and essentially was responsible for an opposite regime change, uh, one that, one that uh, could get worse? I mean, there is a scenario in which inflation expectations just feed off one another. And if the Fed doesn't tighten aggressively incredibly enough, it only needs another shock on top of that, of the sort that we saw in 1973, for inflation to get even higher. And here I want to kind of pivot to geopolitics to give HR 
a crack of the whip. One of the things I'm very struck by as we as we look ahead to, to 2022 is just how much geopolitical risk there is in the world. It's not just that we can envision confrontation over Taiwan. We've talked about that very many times on this show. But there's also uh, increasing evidence that there is not going to be a diplomatic breakthrough with Iran, uh, that Iran is, in fact, extremely close to having nuclear weapons. Uh, and at the same time, uh, President Putin uh, has been apparently on the brink of invading Ukraine, sending an into or continuing his invasion of Ukraine, to be precise. These right. three things, if you take them in combination, uh, imply a potentially very, very scary uh, 2022. If they all happen at once, I don't know how HR's former colleagues in the Pentagon are going to cope. Well, I want to, to return to that idea of a cascade or avalanche of events. It's a really important concept uh, from complexity theory that an initial crisis, a pandemic, uh, is in fact historically significant because of its consequences, not just because of its death toll. And I think this will be true uh, in the case of COVID-19 because I think its economic consequences, for example, have been much bigger than its public health consequences. In terms of mortality, it's not one of history's really big pandemics, but in terms of its economic impact, it's almost up there with a world war. So I'm gonna make five predictions which have a kind of cascade-like quality to them. There will be a pie variant of the virus. We're on Omicron, there will be a pie variant and we will work our way through the Greek alphabet. I suspect, but I can't be certain, that each wave caused by a new virus will be less deadly. There's, uh, some reason to hope that, but it's not certain. Uh, so don't bank on post-pandemic life in 2022. I think the stock market stock market's going to tank at some point, and I think it'll be led by meme stocks and tech companies that don't actually make money. Uh, I, I think this will happen whether the Fed tightens too much or too little. Uh, I mean, basically, markets are not going to like high inflation, nor are they going to like uh, a really significant monetary tightening. I want to add a prediction about the technology realm. I think the metaverse will bomb. I've come to the conclusion, having thought about it, that I can't imagine anything worse than uh, my avatar uh, having a great time in a virtual world with me wearing goggles. Forget it. Not, not, I'm not buying, and I suspect a lot of people will feel the same way. I mean, this is the escapism that only makes the cascade of disaster in the real world more likely. Fourth, I think, obviously, politically, the Democrats are going to lose the House, but I think they're going to lose the Senate as well. Uh, and finally, just bringing it back to geopolitics, I think for all of these reasons, we're going to end up with at least one of three possible wars, and maybe more than one. Uh, so, Remember all that talk a year ago about the Roaring Twenties? We were going to have the Roaring Twenties just like they, they did after 1919. Well, I, I said then on this show, we'll get the Roaring 2021, but that'll be it. And I think for that reason, I expect uh, 2022 to be anything but Roaring, or if it roars, it'll be a battle cry. <laughs> 